points that I did. So last night I mentioned seven points, seven framework kind of categories for thinking about the Christian vision of sexuality. The first one was that it's a storied vision, that sex you can't go to directly or in isolation, that it needs to be seen within the larger story of who God is and why he created the world and what it means to be a human being, what we're here for, and, and that the therefore of Genesis 2.24 is given what God, who God is and how he's created the world, therefore this is what sex looks like. Um, and that is always a storied narrative framework. And so the first and central question we ask is not, hey, what are the consequences of this ethic? Or does this stay true to my internal desires? It's does this fit within the story of why God created the world? Um, and that story is a very different story than our culture lives by. The second one, and I'm sure we'll come back to this in various ways today. I mentioned this last night. I think this is the greatest need of the seven in our culture today among Christians, which is that sex is creational. That is, it's not a religious category. It's not a spiritual category. Um, it's not up for grabs, but it fits within an order, a structure that's already in creation. And just as we wake up in this world needing to eat and needing to sleep, we wake up in this world already male and female, already with structures that limit us and direct us. And there is an order in creation that wisdom should perceive, that holiness conforms to. And then and, and the great phrase of Marilyn Robinson, the givenness of things includes sex. Um, and so there are boundaries, there are limits around it, there are purposes, and I think the creational dimensions of sex are one of the one of the big categories we need to reclaim in our culture. Number three, it's symbolic. It points beyond itself and ultimately to the coming wedding between God and his people, Christ and the church. And, and one of the things we talked about at length last night, and this is maybe the most helpful thing to just keep in front of your eyes as often as you can, that every single no the Bible gives to don't do this, don't do this, don't do that when it comes to sex is not only protecting, but it's also reflecting the shape of our relationship with God. Just as God doesn't um, hook up with us for two weeks and then dump us for somebody else, just as God gives himself fully to us and doesn't split his affections with another part of creation, um, we are not to practice polygamy or simply temporary relationships. Um, and, and just every aspect of our sexual relationship and marriage is literally a direct reflection of the shape of a human being's relationship with God, and that is why the shape of it is what it is. It's not ancient prejudice or bigotry. It's not saying, well, the Babylonians do it this way. That seems to work. Let's just keep doing it. Um, it's just literally a reflection of our relationship with God. And in fact, I didn't mention this last night, maybe the central passage in the holiness codes of the Torah is in Leviticus 10, which you can look up later, and the priests are there in Israel and the people of God to teach the people of God holiness, and holiness is about learning to, in Leviticus 10, separate or distinguish the clean from the unclean, the holy from the profane, and the verb for distinguish or separate there is the word that dominates Genesis 1. God separated the heaven and the earth. He separated the sky and the sea. He separated the day from the night. And holiness is about saying, and I'm going to make those same distinctions in my life. Um, the prophets often say, great places, I think it's Isaiah 5, this may be wrong, um, but woe to those who call good evil and evil good. Woe to those who separate and distinguish the world differently and contrary to how God did. One of the things we talked about last night very briefly, which I'll get to in here in a second, that doesn't mean that all of the answers are laid out once for all for us. There's real room for improvisation, for freedom, for us naming the world, but it always needs to take place within the naming that God has already given the world. We are not free to say murder is brave and humility is weakness. We are not free to name the world that way. Um, we are free to name it in some ways, but it's symbolic, and so it points to our relationship with God. And so if there's a beginning of sex, God's creational designs, there's also an end. Sex passes away. We enter into the intimacy, the ecstasy of our embodied relationship with God in the new heavens and new earth, and sex fades away because it played its role. And so yes, it's important, but it's not ultimate. And so the sense of wanting all of our identity, all of our happiness to be found in these kinds of relationships is from the beginning warned against. That's not the role that it plays. Number four, it's covenantal, which is very related to this, that it's in the context of committed family relationships with one another that mirrors our covenant relationship with God 
Um, one thing I didn't say last night, which I'll say here, is N.T. Wright often talks about this in his writings, and I think it's very insightful, that the early church had a problem on his hands in, in many ways, but one of them was because the early church was transcultural and no longer just Jewish, if you wanted to ask in the ancient world, who are the Jews? Yes, who's circumcised, who's eating kosher food, who's keeping the Sabbath? And that's how you know who's descended from Abraham. So, you know, in the New Covenant, if you want to ask, who are the people of God in the world? You all of a sudden have a complicated question to answer. Because you can't just say who's circumcised or who's keeping kosher or who's keeping Sabbath, because we're free from those things now. And N.T. Wright argues, um, and I think he's just reflecting what, what's clearly there, is that the two boundary markers that separate the people of God from the world are we don't practice idolatry and we don't practice sexual immorality. Those are the two biggest obvious sticking points of when you look at a community that's not practicing idolatry and not practicing sexual immorality, they're going to stand out like a sore thumb from everybody else around them. And these are the two boundary markers, which is why I don't think I mentioned this last night, but some of you are probably familiar with the New Testament is filled with what's often called viceless. In Galatians 5, the fruit of the Spirit is this, but the works of the flesh are this, and don't do all these bad things. And if you read all of the 20 or 25 vice lists together, there's so many bad things we're not supposed to do, right? So many bad things. And, and sometimes we're like, what does this word even mean? And is it just this word over here, but said a different way? But there are only two words that show up in every vice list. Idolatry and porneia, sexual immorality. These are the two words that dominated the pastoral strategy of the early church. Holiness, our distinction from the outside world, needs to include abstaining from idolatry, just worshiping the Lord, and sexual immorality, not using our bodies in impure ways, but honoring God with our bodies and not wronging one another with them. And by the way, that is, um, we will talk about this this morning, even here in a minute, but porneia, where we get pornography from, it's kind of the catch-all term in the New Testament for illicit sin, illicit sexual behavior that's out of bounds. And the question is always, what's in porneia? Because usually it's not mentioned, like, oh, that means these nine things. But I think it flows out of creation, we'll see, um, that it's it's a reference to extramarital sex, to same sex, um, sex to incest, to bestiality, to adultery, to premarital sex, to all of these things. Um, and it all flows out of this idea that we are to stay within the logic and the beautiful boundaries of creation. Um, and that's a boundary marker from the people of God. Um, I mentioned this last night, but there's a great book. It's not on this topic per se, but Tim Keller has often referenced this book in the last five years. It's by Larry Hurtado, The Destroyer of the Gods. And the subtitle is, is something about the distinctiveness of early Christianity in the Greco-Roman world. And as a historian, he's just pointing out that many people today, with our overall negative take on the influence and the role of Christianity in Western culture, much of which is justified, nonetheless often look at the rise of the early church as just a cosmic accident. Like there was nothing different there. There was nothing good there. Somehow the accident of history came and Western and Christianity came to be the dominant view. And it just points out that whatever you make of Christianity's truth claims, it was a profoundly new and profoundly different thing on the scene in the ancient world. And one of the two or three biggest sticking points was the profoundly different orientation towards sexuality and sexual relationships in the ancient Greco Roman world. And, and, and this is one of our points this morning is the missional stuff. And I hope that this is eventually encouraging to us. The early church was regularly despised and ostracized and seen suspiciously and pressured for a couple of reasons, and one of them is their sexual practices. That any time, the early church was not trying to impose their view on everybody else, unlike some Western Christians today. But, and you notice, simply saying no in your own life to something everybody else is saying yes to, everybody else perceives that as you think you're better than me. You're judging me. In the early Greco-Roman world, perceived that from the early church. Oh, you think you're so better than us. And you're undermining the social order. And so, on the one hand... Christians in all of the ancient literature where Christians are talked about, they are regularly despised, among other things, for this reason. That they don't sleep around, that they don't do this, that they exalt women and they ask men to stay inside of the bounds. Um, all these things that are different. But on the other hand, and, and this will be, a, I'm sure, a big theme this morning, it's also true that no matter how much we want to go outside of God's bounds, as much as we convince ourselves ideologically that this is a good and beautiful way, 
if you consistently walk as an individual or as a society in violation of God's creational purposes, it comes back with a vengeance on you. And the reality is that almost nobody in our world is actually happy in their sexual relationships long term. Almost everybody I talk to, and that's not to say that we're necessarily different, but there is such discontent, pain, restlessness, unhappiness in this area. And that was also true in the ancient world. And so one of the great paradoxes of the early church, but also Christianity, is the very thing that caused people to despise them also became at the same time a profound source of attraction to those outside of the church because they saw life where there was only death outside of the church. They saw harmony where there was only conflict. They saw um, love where there tended to be um, brokenness outside of the church. And so the same things that cause us to be despised by the outside world are often at the same time, the things that in the long run, as people see them embodied, often become something that's attractive to the outside world. We don't have to choose either or there. Um, it actually is often both. Um, and again, for the ancient, for the early church, it was a boundary marker. Um, we'll look at 1 Corinthians 6 in a little while. That's along with 1 Corinthians 7, one of the passages I want us to camp out on today. Um, but it's often thought, especially in our culture today, that the most unpopular view Christians hold is either on sex in general or on same-sex relationships specifically. And, and certainly that is an increasingly and incredibly unpopular view. But I actually think C.S. Lewis makes this argument that's not the most unpopular view Christians hold. The most unpopular view Christians hold is what Paul says at the end of 1 Corinthians 6, which the Bible says over and over, which is, you were created by God, you were redeemed by God, you are not your own, you were bought with a price, so glorify God with your body. The idea that your body is not yours but it belongs to God, that your life is not yours, but it belongs to God's purposes, is the most countercultural conviction Christians hold. And it is what gives rise to a thousand other convictions that make no sense. At the center of the modern worldview is my body is mine and my life is my own. And that's not true. That's not true. C.S. Lewis has that great line in Mere Christianity where he says, if you think you're the landlord of your body, or if you think you are the tenant of your body, is going to lead to some very different decisions in your life. And I think that is what covenant is all about, that we are not our own. We belong to others. We belong to God. We belong to the people that we're in relationship with. And this others-oriented um, orientation is we love God, we love our neighbors, we love ourselves, but there's a hierarchy there, and love of self is on the bottom of the ladder for Christians. And love of self is at the top of the ladder for modern people. And insofar as love of neighbor and love of God can fit into that, then great. But when there's a conflict, love of self wins out in our culture. So those are the first four I talked about last night, just the last couple. Um, and, and again, I think I laid these out, but the fifth one is that sex is bent, it's damaged, it's distorted in our culture. I'll come back to that in one minute. Number six is it's missional. And number seven is that it's socially constructed. It's culturally contingent. And those three I'll just spend a few minutes on, and I will just really just go all over the place the rest of today. We'll take a break at noon for lunch. Um, Thomas Nagel, non-Christian philosopher, I think I, I read this last night, says it is an incredibly insightful fact that all human beings have a category for bad sex, have a category for sex that you should not engage in. Now, what bad sex is in every worldview will be very different, but nobody in the history of the world, including today, says do whatever you want, whenever you want. We have the Me Too movement for a reason. Um, we have laws against pedophilia for a reason. We have laws against bestiality. We have laws against rape for a reason. There is such a thing as bad sex. And there is, even if we don't name it this way, and articulate it this way, everybody knows that sex as it comes to us, sexual desire as it comes to us, is not to be completely trusted. Everybody knows that. We just either talk about it or don't talk about it, account for it in different ways. And so the fact that there is, again, in the New Testament worldview, porneia, sex that's illicit, sex that is not to be engaged in, is a reference to the fact that the world is no longer only good. It's still good. Our bodies are still good, but it's also bent, it's damaged, it's distorted. And so just a, a couple of things um, about this, and, and I'll stop after each point and make sure that you guys can jump in with questions, disagreements, thoughts. Um, this includes certainly 
but it's not exhausted by that your own desires are bent. That's true, but that's not all Christians mean. It also means that your perception of your body and your perception of what sex is for is now clouded by sin, that we need God's revelation to speak to us, and that if we just start from our own intuitions, we will go astray. Not just if you just do what you want, you'll go astray, you will, but if you just follow common sense, you will go astray. It's often pointed out that common sense is actually not common, not just in the sense that we all make bad decisions, but in the sense that what counts as common sense in one culture is incredibly different than what it is in another culture. There was a famous, and again, a, a non-Christian, which I think is itself um, significant and insightful, very famous sociologist and anthropologist at Princeton in the latter half of the 20th century, Clifford Geertz. And, uh, and he's got a great essay called Common Sense as a Cultural Artifact. And what he means by that is what somebody says, this is just obvious. What you really mean is I grew up in a culture that taught me to do this, but it's not obvious. It's not common sense. One of the biggest mistakes I think our culture makes is the level of trust we give to our intuitions. Um, it has been part of the story of sex and romance for a long time in Western culture. Just follow your heart. Let your conscience be your guide. Um, and that goes astray far more often than we like to think. And so also our perception of the world, not just our desires, but I think it's even more than that. It's also the fact, and this, again, I think will be part of the conversation later today, Convictions ideologically and practices in embodied ways cannot be sustained apart from cultures in which they're encouraged and in which they make sense, or communities. Um, Leslie Newbegin, one of my favorite Christian theologians and, and thinkers of the 20th century, used to say that the church is the plausibility structure of the gospel. And what he means by that is if you are on your own reading the Bible in isolation, most of what it says will make no sense to you. Not just in the sense that you won't understand, but in the sense of like, this is terrible. This is terrible compared to the culture I grew up in. But also in the sense that unless you're in a Christian community where you see the goodness of this lived out in practice, where you actually see other people encouraging you, these convictions cannot be sustained. If you walk out of here today, and you're like, you know what, I changed my mind on a couple of things, that this makes a little more sense to me, and you just do the spiritual Lone Ranger thing, five months from now, maybe five days from now, you look back at this and be like, that was crazy. That was crazy what Nick was saying. If you just isolate yourself in our culture, these convictions cannot be sustained and these practices cannot happen. So the world, sexuality is also bent and damaged in that we are no longer in context in which the original creational purposes of God are easy. They're no longer easy. We not only are often not supported, but we're often in contexts where, whether it's society around us, whether it's our bodies falling apart, whether it's the brokenness of our families, that we are in contexts where everything around us does not encourage us in these directions. And that means that our sexuality is fraught with difficulty in a fallen world. Um, we're going to see that, that one of the biggest mistakes, I think, conservative Christians make today is rightly they're unapologetic about the beauty of God's original purposes. And I think we should be, but they're often incredibly naive about the cost of them. In our cultural moment, you will suffer a lot if you want to be faithful to Jesus in sex, just like anything else, both because it will mean saying no to a lot that's broken in your own life, because it will mean wrestling with the confusion of, my culture says this, but the Bible's... And, and you'll regularly be in those moments where you just don't know how to make sense of something. And you will be in situations where if you're willing to violate God's designs, there are short-term benefits. And if you're committed to God, there are short-term costs. And we need to be really clear to that. One of, the, one of the biggest differences, I'm convinced, of most churches, especially in a place like New York today... And in the ancient church in Jesus, is Jesus was so upfront with people, count the cost before you sign up. Count the cost before you sign up. I have found in 15 years of ministry, 20 years of being Christian, that this experience replays itself over and over. I became a Christian. I heard this great story of what it was going to be to be a Christian. And three years in, I learned this and nobody told me. Hmm. Was that in the fine print underneath signing on the dotted line? And that's not to say that we need to say everything to everybody right away. But if there's not an expectation that following Jesus in a fallen world, in our fallen bodies, with our fallen minds and our fallen hearts, is regularly going to be experienced as going against the grain, as leading to suffering, then we're just lying to people and to ourselves. And so 
one of the two or three biggest tragedies of this purity culture that has often existed among conservative Christians is the blatantly false promises that it made to people. It's the blatantly false promises that it made to people. Following God's way in sex, and, and again, this is a paradox. There's, there's tension here. And, and the really hard thing maybe is that it plays itself out differently in everybody's life. Some people will follow the way of Jesus when it comes to sex, and they really will flourish, and other people will end up like Job. And they will suffer more for having done it. And we need to be really honest that, to use an image that I found helpful, Christopher Ash uses this, if the creation story leads us to see the world as having roads that are already paved out, um, doors that are already closed and already open, and a world to navigate, and if you always tell the truth, you'll flourish, and if you lie, your relationships will fall apart, the doctrine of sin reminds us that an earthquake has happened. And some doors that should be shut are now open, and some doors that should be open are now shut, and some of you will be faithful to one spouse for the rest of your life, and it will be a constant source of pain and discontentment. And others of you might just go do whatever you want, and for significant chunks of your life, it'll be really fun. And we can't deny that that's the case. That is the case. It doesn't deny um, these larger things, but... This is why Proverbs needs to be balanced with Ecclesiastes, why Deuteronomy needs to be balanced with Job. The wisdom literature of Deuteronomy and Proverbs is more describing the world as God created it and as it should be, and Job and Ecclesiastes and books like that are describing it as it actually is, and we still live in a world with a map that God has given us, and the reality is that all things being equal, if you tell the truth, you'll flourish, and if you lie, you won't, but all things are so often not equal in our world. There is oppression, there is damage culturally in our own bodies, and if you are going to stay within the boundaries, there is going to be a cost. Now, there's also a promise attached to it, absolutely, but I think that we need to be really upfront that in the short run, especially, you will often, perhaps likely, look around at other people and be like, what am I doing saying no to these things that everybody else is saying yes to, and they're so much happier than I am, and that is going to be part of the cost of discipleship for the church. Overall, it's true that I think if you look at a community over 30 years that practices faithful, monogamous, committed, costly relationships, overall, I think the mental health and the flourishing of that community will be higher. But one, there are often so many exceptions to that. But, but also, when you're the one in the marriage that doesn't live up to it, are the statistics encouraging to you? No. And if we don't have a story that narrates that for people ahead of time, we are setting people up to be disgruntled with the Christian story. And I think that's part of why Christians are often disgruntled, is I was told a story that my experience has denied. Um, and, And one of the things we will talk about a little later is that gap. The gap between the way God created the world and the way it is. The way it should be and the way I actually experience it in my story. And 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 maybe to throw this out, some of you have heard me put it this way before. One of the many things that I think liberals and conservatives actually have in common in our culture is that they are incredibly overconfident in not only the truth of their position, but in the goodness of the consequences of their position. And liberals and conservatives tend to be in our culture, whether religiously, politically, whatever, um, incredibly committed to never being uncomfortable incredibly committed to never being uncomfortable. And and the proper biblical response to the gap between what is and what should be, between God's designs and our fallen experience, is lament. And I know this is going a little off topic, but there is no way to have a healthy sexuality in the long term without lament being really central to your life. If you are going to say, as many conservative Christians do, well, I'm actually experiencing ruining catastrophe as I'm faithful to God, but la, 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 it's actually amazing, it's actually amazing and you just constantly deny your experience, you are either going to be incredibly schizophrenic or you're going to finally just leave the faith at some point. Or you say, well, I followed Jesus and five minutes in, my experience isn't paying off, and so I'm just going to trust my experience. Your experience is not obvious, even if you think Christianity is not true, and it doesn't come with built-in instructions. The tension between faith and experience, revelation and, 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 and our experience in the modern world, there is a tension between those things. And what liberals and conservatives will each equally tempt you to is to deny that there's a tension to just choose one side over the other. And lament is the refusal to choose and to stay in the midst of the tension and to trust God even while calling out, why is this so broken, God, if you're good? 
Um, and I don't think marriage, singleness, whatever it is, it can't be sustained if lament is not part of our practice. There will be, I think, on average for most of us, there will be benefits we get to experience that our non-Christian friends don't experience the more we honor God in this area, but there will also be costs that you are asked to pay that other people get to avoid because you are being faithful, because the world has experienced an earthquake. And it is no longer a place that is only conducive to faithfulness to God. Often in the short run, faithfulness, this is why the classic question is, why do the righteous suffer and why do the wicked prosper? And there's a lot of mystery there, but the overall perspective in the scripture is because the world is not the way it ought to be and we are not the way it ought to be. It's not a denial that these things aren't there. And so um, I'll end with this and I'll throw it out to you guys before we go to the last two points. I didn't put it on your further reading because it's, it's one, it's not about sex per se, but it's also, to be honest, it's a really weighty, complicated, dense, abstract book to read. And, and so if you want to go after it, I commend it. But one of the most brilliant Christian ethicists in the last 50 years, it's a guy who taught at Oxford for a long time, Oliver, Od Oliver O'Donovan. And he's got a book called Resurrection and Moral Order. And the basic thesis of the book is that the resurrection of Jesus reconfirms and reestablishes the original created order. It doesn't take us into a new, different spiritual dimension. And he has, he has so many great insights in that book. I'll probably read you a couple of quotes by him in a bit. But he has an insight, a way of saying it, that I come back to in my life over and over again. And it's not just true in sex. It's true everywhere. As he says this, the created order is still there. And it's still good. And it still needs to be lived within. But it's fractured, and we are fractured. And the world around us is fractured. And so our perception of it and our experience of it is no longer unambiguously good, even as we inhabit it. And so he makes this claim, the only way back to creation is through the cross. And every promise Jesus makes of, unless you take up my cross, unless you take up your cross, unless you die, you live, that, that we often forget that. There's always a so that, so that you'll live, so that you'll gain your life, so that you'll flourish. But there is no reclaiming the original goodness of creation without dying with Jesus on the cross. And we just leave that out of discipleship in Western Christianity. Um, discipleship and sexuality need to be cruciform. You will not be able to be a good spouse if you are not in the habit of regularly dying to what, you're, what you want your life to look like. You will not be a good parent unless you regularly say no to a thousand desires that you could otherwise pursue. That's not because these things are not good. It's because we live in a world that has been profoundly fractured. And if we don't take that seriously, we will go in one of two very, very unhelpful directions. Um, so again, sexuality is bent, damaged, distorted. I, I mentioned this last night, but the word natural is both used in scripture a lot and also in our culture. And whatever natural means, Romans 1, 1 Corinthians 11, the ancient Greco-Roman ethicists, um, it doesn't mean how we initially perceive the world or experience our desires. To say that this kind of sex is contrary to nature is not to say that it's necessarily contrary to our subjective experience. It's saying that it's contrary to the way God originally made the world. But the reality is that most sex that's faithful to God will be incredibly contrary to nature in another way. And it will be going against the grain. And that's why discipleship always includes death on the way to resurrection, denial of self on the way to loving God and loving your neighbor. In a perfect world, and in the world when God redeems it one day, and this is, this is a tangible way to think about our hope, you will one day be able to love God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, and your neighbor as yourself and in front of yourself, and never lose anything you want. You are not able to do that now. You are regularly confronted in a fallen world with having choices where either you love God and your neighbor or you love yourself and you cannot do both. And the cost of discipleship, that's where it originates because we live in this world that's experienced an earthquake because of human sin. And that is just as true in sex as it is anywhere else. And so I think one of the, one of the big so unnecessary stumbling blocks well is we give such naive, unbiblical promises to people of what will happen if they are faithful to God in this area. Again, we shouldn't shy away from, yes, there will be benefits, and yes, some people really will, in an unambiguous way, just really flourish, but some people will actually experience more suffering than they otherwise would have if they follow God's way. Um, and I'm sure we'll talk about this later, um, 
but I think especially here of the incredible role that I think gay Christians play in our culture today and what is being asked of them and the cheap answers the church often gives to them of what the cost of discipleship actually looks like. Um, and that's one of the reasons, there's many, that I think for gay Christians, the impossibility and the lack of coherence of the Christian ethic is coming from a lot of things, but one of them is the false promises we have made to everybody in the church about what following Jesus looks like. Um, and so, yeah, suffering is going to be a part of this. It's not everything, but it will be. Um, and honestly, last thing, and I'm going to throw it to you guys, if you know that going into your marriage, that's an important thing for you to know. If you go into that saying, I really think that maybe God's calling me to be single long term or maybe for the next five years, if you know that going in, I know in one sense it's discouraging, but it's actually one of the best things you can ever know. Um, to not be, as First Peter says, to not be surprised at the suffering that comes your way. Suffering is hard, but the surprise of suffering is often harder. And that meta stuff is often what really trips us up. I just thought that like this purity culture stuff was going to be, I was going to be having great sex for the rest of my life with my wife. And all of a sudden, that's not what it is. Um, and that's where the bent, the damage, the distorted aspect, I think, becomes really important to our story. Um, and so, yeah, let me stop there, throw it off to you guys. I know that's, that's one of the heavy ones, but it is really important that we talk about it. Peter. Yeah, may I uh, just comment on, on the term gay Christian? Yeah. Um, you know, I know you've mentioned Wesley Hill, yeah. who, um, you know, is same-sex attractive, yeah. but, you know, adhering to sort of a biblical ethic yeah. or... Um, uh, you know, abstinence, sexual abstinence, and celibacy, and yet Wesley Hill labels himself as a gay Christian. Yes, I I believe that is a mistake. Yeah, um, because of you know just how so many people sure. fear that term. Sure, that, you know to say I, I understand it's a shorthand way of you know describing oneself and one's life. You know that part of one's life experience, yeah. but. So many people hear it as I'm self-affirming yes. of these desires. I'm yeah. living into these desires, and that's that's not Wesley Hill's no. position, and yet he uses that label for for describing yeah. himself, which is a problem that I have. That's, sure, that's one problem that I sure. have with Wesley Hill. Yeah, so I just wanted. To and yeah, as you know, that's a big conversation in this community right now. As, as, um, because again, I think it's probably fair to say that for all of the challenges of our cultural moment, one of the long term benefits is the church is having to wrestle with this in specific pastoral, practical ways, maybe for the first time ever. And this is one of the debates, which is what language do we use for people who seem to experience intractable, un, um, can't be reoriented in new directions, sexual desires towards someone of the same gender, but who's committed to the traditional sex ethic, and, and to be blatant, the pray the gay away just doesn't work. What do you do with the way you name your own experience? With how, you, how do you relate to the larger queer community? And I think that's one of the debates. And, and obviously, um, maybe the simplest thing I say is I don't finally have the, I think, ability or platform to be the person that, that speaks into that. I, I think maybe the briefs that I made, I understand your perspective and I understand Wesley's perspective. And, and for those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, I'll mention some books if you want to read this. And, and Wesley Hill is a good friend of mine from grad school, has never been attracted to women, is an incredibly faithful, teaches theology at a seminary, brilliant theologian, wrote a great book called Washed and Waiting, which is his autobiography, and then a later book called Spiritual Friendship. And one of the first things I would encourage you to do if you want to get into this more is there's an online community of various LGBTQ on the spectrum Christians and their experience, but who are committed to the historic view of the church called Spiritual Friendship Online. And this is always one of the big debates. Um, and, and I think there's also, uh, there are reasons that I think, given our cultural moment, that it also makes sense to me um, to not immediately distance yourself from the experience. But yeah, but ultimately, I'm, I'm speaking from the cheap seats. And so, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm just just quick follow-up. Yeah, go I, for it. I think it... It creates less confusion, yep. um, especially in the minds of fellow Christians. You know, for someone of that experience to describe 
oneself as yeah. you know, same-sex attracted yeah. as opposed to gay. Yeah. Because gay has taken on a whole political, there's that's always true. political yeah. baggage yeah. that's attached to the term gay, whereas yeah. same-sex attracted, yeah. it, you know, it, yep. it, it communicates information. Yeah, yeah there's, more there's challenges in either a, direction. Yeah, a, yeah. Pol a political, neutral yeah. way. So yeah, there is a sense in which, and, and we'll come back to this, because I do want to speak about whether this is where we're coming from in our experience, or we're all in churches where this is an issue for so many of our brothers and sisters, and all of you have friends and co-workers and family members. And so how do we practically pastoral walk through this, and we'll talk about that a little later. But I think there is a sense in which this question is a subset of the larger question. Once a word that's important, whether in a negative way or a positive way, begins to mean multiple things to different people, like, do we still use the word evangelical? Um, love means a billion things, so do we still use the word love? Um, and there's always the question of, do we reclaim it, or do we ditch it and come up with a new one? And if you ditch it and come up with a new one, then somebody else is going to misuse it, and then you're going to ditch it again. And so I don't think there's ever an easy way forward when it comes to the ambiguity of, of labels and words and things like that. But yeah, it, it, is, it is an important way of how do you name your own experience and who you are when on the one hand you're following Jesus, but on the other hand, these experiences and desires continue to be a part of your fallen experience of the world. Um, and when you're also living in a cultural context where language like this is increasingly used for anybody who fits this kind of profile. And yeah, that's, it's a really complicated discussion. Yeah. I do think for, for all of us, one of the things in our prayer, in our emotional relational support, I think these kinds of communities where Christians who do experience very significant same-sex desires and are wrestling over, not just what do we believe about this, but, but how do we sustain a long-term faithful discipleship when all the church seems to be saying to us historically is, by the way, here's a list of 17 things you can never do. See you later. And it's like, good luck with that. Um, and the reality is, is, um, is unless the church is a kind of community that can sustain not just for people on the queer spectrum, but single people, people in really hard on satisfying marriages, unless we're a community can actually sustain the support of being able to still engage in the world, even when this has not only been satisfying to you, but has actually failed you, this area of your life, then at the end of the day, we're just talking ideology. Um, nobody consistently on average is going to be doing this stuff. Um, and so, yeah, yeah, we'll talk about that a little while more. It's good. Other questions, other thoughts about, yeah, Chelsea. Um, related to purity culture, I think like one of the damaging effects effects of purity culture could be like shame yeah. in sex in marriage I think particularly for women like like being told up until marriage like you know just don't think about it don't, do it, don't <laughs> yeah. talk about it and then yeah. all of a sudden it's beautiful yeah um like my question is how would you counsel people who are single practically to like acknowledge that we're sexual beings yeah. without like you know participating in yeah it's a great question. I remember when I was in college, I'd become a Christian. I, I knew a girl in my college. I think she was a year ahead of me, and she had grown up. I mean, she grew up in New Jersey, but she grew up in like a really fundamentalist, conservative Christian home. Well, I think she was homeschooled. Everything was the purity culture. I think she had the purity culture ring, all that stuff. And she started dating a guy seriously, first relationship ever she had. And I remember as I got close to engagement that that there were a small group of us hanging out late one night, um, and she just made the comment that I find it really hard to think about having sex with Zach once we get married in a positive way. Because my entire life has been, this is dirty, this is awful, this is something that you should absolutely feel shame if you're experiencing these desires now. And so yeah, I just remember for the first time being like, whoa, like yeah, what would you do with that if your habits have actually been trained to respond with repulsion and negativity to this area of your life? Part of the answer, I think, is we need to do stuff like this more often. And it doesn't necessarily need to be, you know, this big picture, but we need to have spaces where we intentionally talk about these things, where we name it as the main thing about your sexual desire is it is good. Yeah, it's bent all of us in different ways, but the main thing is it's good. Um, that, that, I think I, I put it in, in one of the advertisements for this early on, but there's this great line by a guy who's in the band Flatlanders, and he grew up in, like, I think, Texas in, like, a conservative Baptist church. He's got this great way of putting it where he says, for those of us who grew up in the Bible Belt, we heard two things from the church. One, God loves you, and he's going to torture you in hell forever. <laughs> two, sex is dirty, and it's awful, and it's nasty, and you should save it for the one that you love. Um, and then he says, and you wonder why we're all crazy. 
Um, and it really is true that part of it is, is just this, if Scott McKnight has a great line where he says the gospel for most Christians begins in Genesis 3 and it ends in Revelation 20. <laughs> that it starts with you're a terrible sinner and you deserve to go to hell, but Jesus died for you and you're going to heaven when you die. In creation and new creation, it starts at sin and it ends at final judgment. And the original goodness and the reclamation of the original goodness are left out. And I think a simple way to put it is we've got to start with the goodness of creation, sexuality, the image of God. We've got to end with, and it points to something beyond itself that's good that we're all leading to. We need to have spaces for it. I know this isn't specifically your question, but I wanted to go here later on, and maybe we can do this more. But, but I, would, I would take it even one step further. In dating, for, for those of you who are younger and not married, in the church today, one of the most practical pastoral questions is it is increasingly often the case that one or both people, as they enter a dating relationship, have incredibly painful sexual histories. What do we do with that? How do you, how do you start, how should you think about it? If you've lived one way and the person that you're interested in is somebody else that is interested in you, has, has got a very different background, a very different set of experiences, and, and two weeks in, two months in, whatever, you kind of begin to learn this about each other, how, how should you think about that? How should you navigate that? And I really do think that purity culture there too just sets people up to feel like they're permanently stained and tainted failures because of things that have happened. And so I'll, I'll flesh this out a little while longer, a little later, but I'm actually of the conviction, as always, you're free to disagree with this, that the sexual history of the person you're dating should not be a significant factor in your openness to dating them. Now, I have to qualify that. What I, I don't mean that if they've been sleeping around for 10 years and they've been doing it until two days ago and you meet them, yes, that should be a factor. But if they have failure in the past, and now they're following Jesus, I just think you're not allowed to use that as a criteria for saying no to them. I think that's a denial of the gospel. I just think you're relating to somebody in a way that God doesn't relate to us. Um, and so that would be another manifestation of we need to talk about um, our stories as if we really are sinners saved by grace, all of us, and not just some of us are sinners and the rest of us are kind of pure. And purity culture erects a distinction between the righteous and the wicked on a basis other than the gospel. Um, and so that requires a lot of pastoral wisdom, but I think the ways we talk about this and really talking practically in such a way where we name all of our experiences as failure, as sin, as outside of God's purposes, and we need grace to stand before God and one another. Um, and yeah, I think has a lot of connotations long term. So we can come back to this. Um, go for it. So I'm uninformed. Can you define what purity culture means? So purity culture, and because I didn't grow up in the church, it's it's mostly secondhand for me. But it's uh, who's the guy who just walked away from the faith? Josh Harris kissed dating. I kissed dating goodbye. It's like often dating is seen negatively. Courtship is better. Um, often wearing purity rings and making promises that you're not going to have sex until you get married. And often, and, and again, I'm sure that there is good stuff in this culture too. I don't want to go to the other direction and say it's all bad. But often motivated by very explicit, elaborate promises of how fantastic your marriage and your sexual life is going to be if your premarital stage of life is faithful to God's purposes and just a movement, and again, understandably in our cultural context where premarital sex is so ubiquitous, but just a way um, to try to shepherd young Christians towards purity before they get to marriage, but with some very, very harmful sociological and theological ways that it came about. Yeah. Go for it. Jess. Um, so, like, obviously God forgives all sins, and you are all a new creation. Yeah. But that isn't to say that the consequences, no. the physical consequences or emotional consequences yes. of sin won't be there anymore. Yes. And so I feel like it's hard to kind of reconcile it having is. that like understanding of I'm forgiven and there is no sin in me anymore, but also knowing that, but I probably will be living out the consequences yeah, of my sin that's a anyway. Great question. And so, how do you reconcile yep. that in, within yourself, but also with other people? Yeah, when you such are a good question. Them, but also recognizing that what you've done has caused. Yeah, me absolutely. Yeah, and that is the danger of the view I just held, which is you could be naive the other way. Be like, hey, we're forgiven. There's no history here anymore. And yeah, you're right. There are consequences. 
I, I think the first thing I would say is I'd back up and I would place this in the larger category that we all, I think, would have intuitions that there are things that have gone wrong in all of our lives that we now bear the consequences of in our families and our physical health and the choices we made and young guys watching pornography from the earliest age they can remember. Um, nobody, in a fallen world in general, but especially in our culture, nobody gets to 18 without carrying significant baggage in our culture. And we all have it. And I think we would all have a sense of like some forms of that would be incredibly judgmental and puritanical and self-righteous to be like, oh, that's what you experienced and you're like, oh, you, you struggle with depression a little, oh, I'm not gonna date you. But then I think we would all have a sense that like, if we're walking through the world like that, we're just relating to each other on another basis than the gospel. But I would also say this, if you're dating someone who experiences regular depression, you should be really realistic about what that might look like in the future. If you're dating someone who was abused as a child, or if you were abused as a child, and it's very difficult for sexual desire to be experienced in a positive way, that should not be the reason you say no to somebody. I really think it shouldn't be, but there should be a real awareness of, okay, so this is gonna be one of our sets of challenges that we uniquely have, like somebody else has here, and I really don't don't think that Christians should engage, and we'll talk about this later, I don't think we should buy into the ideology, ideology of the consumeristic, you know, dating is me looking for the best possible combination of maximally good experiences and avoiding suffering. I just think that that plays into a story, that one that's not true, and that two in other ways is going to backfire on you. If that's what you're prioritizing, it's going to backfire on you. Um, I do think that that ultimately, and we'll talk about this this afternoon as well, I do think there's real freedom in dating. There's not just right and wrong. There are wrong, for sure. People you shouldn't date, people you shouldn't marry. But there's not a right person. Um, this problem is why there is no such thing as a soulmate. Um, there's not one person that's right for you. Um, it's not the role that marriage plays. And you do have real freedom to say, even though this person is a faithful Christian here, I don't have to marry them just because they're a faithful Christian. Absolutely. I would just say, and again, that there's, there's a subjective art to this. It's not just a science objectively. But I, I really think that the criteria should be, do they love God and do they love their neighbor? Not the shape in which their experience comes in its particular manifestations. Um, within that, I think there is some freedom, um, but I think the criteria we're using in dating should be criteria that flows out of the gospel, and the reality is that the decisions a lot of us make with dating, we would be horrified if God related to us that way. We'd be horrified if God related us that way. Yes, ma'am? Um, I, I know you said that you can't change that would be too impactful, but I was wondering, what is the ultimate, I, I was thinking about Yeah. 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 Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so definitely some of this stuff last night landed on that. Then we start with sex is good. Don't feel ashamed of your sexual desires. Also to really narrate that it's not that there's a certain subset of us who are broken and twisted. We are all twisted. We are all broken. Like, like Christians, some of you have heard this. There's this great quote from Martin Luther which often can be taken out of context when he says two things, sin boldly and believe in Christ more boldly still. And what he means by that is not go out and have fun and then feel sorry for it later, which it can sound like that. What he means is that when most of us describe ourselves as sinners, we're just giving lip service to that. We're like, those are the really bad people over there, me and my cool friends. Like, we're, we're pretty good. We're pretty righteous. We're pretty woke. And whether you're conservative or liberal, we all kind of do that. We draw the distinction between the righteous and the wicked in completely different places than God does. Um, and no one is righteous, no, not one. Also needs to be a part of how we raise our kids that all of us are broken in different ways. And to just give ourselves categories from that to name our experience early on. And certainly, um, this goes back to something that, that Erica asked earlier I, uh, about the family the biological family in the church, I'd also say this, that yes, the biological family is important, but some conservative Christians often describe the family as if it's the primary place of worship, the primary place of discipleship, the primary place of education, which is why some Christians are really, really um, kind of obsessive about private school, homeschool, stuff like that. And it's fine to homeschool your kids. Public school system, I came through it. It's no picnic in the park. I'm, I'm not, you know you know, 
idealistic about that, but nonetheless, the local church is the primary forum of the discipleship of your children, not the family. Um, and so the church needs to be a place where overall our kids are seeing and hearing a story from other Christians other than just us, that this is good, that this is what makes sense, this is how somebody deals with and is accepted by the community when they've got baggage and brokenness from their backgrounds. And so I think, again, the, the, the church is the plausibility structure of the gospel. And, and one practical way to think about that is even if you're perfect parents, which none of you are or will be, and you raise your kids spotlessly, they're going to be 18 one day and leave, and from then on out, it's the local church. And so if the local church isn't a big part of their life and discipleship now, um, there is a Christian version of helicopter parenting, um, and it's often this, which is I need to control their exposure to the outside world. I need to make sure they get to marriage without having sex. I need to make sure they meet another pure little boy or girl that they marry. Um, and I just think, again, um, this is where lament is a part of our story. So to say this out loud, if you have, um, if you have never engaged in a sexual relationship before you get to marriage as a Christian, Praise God. That's a good thing. Like, yeah, there's danger for boasting there and pride, but that's good. I mean, we should celebrate in your life. And if you meet someone who's got a really rocky history, I don't think you should use that at all as a criteria for saying no to them, but you are allowed to lament that. You are allowed to lament that. You're allowed to lament the pain of it. You're allowed to be disappointed by it. And to make this super specific, where this really came on my radar is a number of years ago. He's not here, so I won't mention his name, but, but I'll just kind of share the overall shape of the story. Knew a guy in college ministries, he's a student of mine, really incredible guy, really gifted, really mature, grew a lot in college, and he grew up in a church, and he started getting interested in a girl a couple of years after college, and she was actually in our college fellowship too, but I think she was a year or two younger than him, and they actually ran into each other on the West Coast long after college, and, uh, and they began to get interested in each other, and, and as soon as it is, like, oh, these two make so much sense together, this is really cool, um, and they began to be attracted to each other, and they started doing it. And then he learned that she had slept around with a guy earlier on in her life. And he just went nuts. And he just went nuts. And he's like, oh, I don't feel like I can ever trust her. I just feel like I was faithful to God in this area. And, that, and I just feel like I'm kind of giving up something. And I just remember sitting down and being like, you need to grow up. You need to grow up. That this is not, this woman has been following Jesus for years she is faithful, she is incredibly beautiful and gifted and funny and intelligent and loves God, and you are not allowed to say no to her because of this, because God will never say no to you for that. Now again, if she had engaged in a long history of doing this and it ended two minutes before their first date, then wisdom means, yes, it's not time, but that's wisdom, not you're eternally outside of the realm of the righteous, whereas I am inside of it. And so wisdom should be a category here, but I don't think, and again, this is where it's super practical. There are all things being equal, very few young people in our churches today who are showing up to dating with a clean history, who are showing up to marriage with a clean history. Maybe that's always been true. And, and, and to some degree, of course it is. But in terms of how explicit our culture is, it is very rare for people to get to their mid-20s and to not have really complicated histories, even if they grow up in the church. And that we need to just be realistic about that pastorally. Um, maybe a church culture arises in the years and decades to come where people who grow up in the church in a way that's healthier than the purity culture of old are able to actually be discipled here. And it's a little sorry. But right now, even if you grow up in the church, the last thing you want somebody to know on your first date is your internet history, right? Especially if you're a guy. Um, what has happened in dating relationships? Like this is where people show up in their early to mid twenties in dating relationships. And that doesn't mean that that's their destiny for the future, not at all. But if we're just saying, hey, wait around for the one person who doesn't have a damaged history, one, you're just asking most Christians to stay single forever. But two, we're just living by a different story than the gospel story just living by a different story than the gospel story. Um, and so again, I don't at all want to play down the pain of this. It's one, there's, there's freedom to lament, um, but don't build your marriage on another foundation than the gospel. Because even if you've shown up in marriage without significant failure stuff, there's going to be failure later on. Maybe not in this area, but in other areas. And you're going to have to relate to each other in response to that failure. Um, and, and again, this, this kind of gets into some of the stuff we'll do this afternoon with dating. But here's, here's a little practical piece of advice of connecting the gospel 
to our actual practice that I increasingly find helpful for students. Even very faithful young Christians, I find, are often doing this, which is they're living by a different story in their dating life than they're going to live by in their marriage. And that can look like 10 different things. And then they just kind of expect they get married. All the old habits are going to go away and the new habits are just going to be born. So we're dating. And we're both like elite Ivy League educated backgrounds. And we're both throughout our mid to late 20s putting our jobs first and working 80 hours a week. And we're just dating long distance and we give each other like two hours a week. And then we're getting married when we're 28 and it's all going to change. It's like you are creating habits where everything else but your relationship is number one. And you shouldn't do that. You are creating habits where the local church is secondary. When I get to my 30s and I settle down, then going to church on a regular basis, though, like part of dating should be actually constructing the habits that we will take in the marriage, not saying, well, it's not marriage, we can do something else. Certainly that's not true sexually, but I think it's also true in these other areas. Again, we need a lot of wisdom. Dating two weeks in should be different than dating a year in, for sure, um, but we should, dating really should be preparation for marriage, and, and you shouldn't ideally get to marriage and just have to spend the first few years of your marriage just tearing down all of the habits that you had in your dating relationship. And again, that's, that's a little more blatant when it comes to sex, but with the idolatry of jobs, with the centralization of education being more important than anything else, with finances, with a lot of stuff, um, we live by different stories before we get married and then we think we can just switch as soon as we get married. That's not true. And again, this is something that we talked about last night, but the one flesh relationship of marriage means that under God, your spouse now is, for the rest of your life, more important than your job, more important than where you live, more important than how much money you have, more important than grad school, more important than your kids, more important than anybody else. And dating should begin to move in those directions. Um, some of the most heartbreaking situations I've seen is when two faithful Christians are dating and they're living by that other, and, and I've been working with Harvard students, Columbia students, I know it's a, a, a bit more of it too, but everybody, especially in a room like this in New York City, we all live by different stories with our careers, with our education, with our money, and then we just want to switch it later on. Um, and I think even earlier on, you can live your life in such a way where if you do want to get married, you can make space for that even now. You can make space for that even now. Um, one of the hardest things is when two people have completely planned out their lives before they start dating, and then they get angry at each other because the other person isn't bending the way they want. And that they're having to bend things that they just built their entire identity and hope on. Um, and we'll talk about that a little later on. What criteria do you use once you're in a relationship, dating, marriage, of if this really is more important than both of our jobs and where we want to live and how much money we have and what we do here, what criteria do we use when, again, in a fallen world, there are so often catch-22, lose-lose situations, and we often, and I would say this, is, is maybe your generation's version of purity culture, you are <clears throat> going to have to sacrifice in your job. You are going to have to sacrifice where you want to live. You are going to have to sacrifice what your weekly routine looks like. Your marriage, if you want to get married, is going to interrupt what you want your life to look like if that person wasn't there. And we often have this, I can have my cake and eat it too. And that's maybe your generation's version of the purity culture. I can have everything the culture promised me as an elite, educated young person in an urban center, and I can get married. And you can't. Not if you want to have a good marriage. Um, and the question becomes, what criteria do you use for where you make those choices along the way? Um, and we'll talk about that a little later on. Other questions? Other thoughts? We're going to end here in the next few minutes. Um, do lunch for an hour. Um, I think Kirk will come up in a minute and he'll tell about some places that we can go to. Go out to lunch together. Hang out with each other. Get to know each other if you don't know each other. Continue the conversation. Bring food back here. Just go take a break beautiful walk outside, whatever you want. Last two points to end, and then we'll spend the afternoon just, again, pursuing implications. Sex is missional, number six. And what I mean by this, and, and I mentioned it very briefly last night, is that when we're told, even before sin comes into the story, that it is not good for human beings to be alone, that does not only or mainly mean, man, it's really existentially lonely to be single. It's just really hard, subjectively. I think that's an implication of it, of the way we're created, but it is not good for man to be alone is a missional statement in Genesis 2. You were created to reflect the image of God, 
And you cannot do that as a man or a woman by yourself, fully. You were created to rule over the world, to steward it wisely, to subdue it, and to bear fruit and multiply and to fill the earth with more image bearers. And sex is required. Gender is required for all those things. So the idea is that from the beginning, and again, I think this is a real countercultural sentiment that our culture doesn't understand, is your sexual desires are not for you alone. They are for the world. Sexual desires in our culture, increasingly, and even families in our culture, often are seen and experienced as a way to escape from the pressures of the world, as a way to get away from it, and we turn inward on ourselves. And your home is where you go to escape and to rest and to have a haven. And that's not what the home was for most cultures. The home was kind of the vantage point from which to engage the world in a healthy way, to be able to have hospitality for strangers, to be able to raise children who will be good citizens and good husbands and fathers themselves, to be able to have a place of stability that builds you up for the world. That marriage, yes, it does turn you inward, but it also turns you outward in a new way. And C.S. Lewis has that great line um, where, by the way, in The Four Loves, and, and we'll come to this this afternoon, I'm sure, C.S. Lewis makes the argument, and I just think he's right, that not only is eros, sexual love, not the highest form of love or not the um, only form of love, but the Christian story makes it clear that friendship is the highest form of love. And I know this is a bit um, perhaps blasphemous to say, or at least trite, but I think given the Christian story that Kirk and Barbara will not be married to one another in the life of the world to come. They will still have a relationship with each other. And I think we can actually say they will be closer to each other than they are now, but will also be closer to one another than we are now. Which means our eternal destiny is not to be married to each other, um, which the, the tripartite wants to say, which means that in the Christian story, married couples are actually just friends with benefits. Um, right? right? That, that's who we are. Right? That's what Christian marriage is, is friends with benefits for a little while. I don't know. Maybe that one isn't how I should say it. Um, but I do think that's what marriage is in the Christian story. Your friends forever benefits now for a little while. Um, friends with benefits. And so it's missional, and that is one of the reasons that sex goes away. Once the mission is accomplished, it's no longer needed. And the mission, both to reflect God's image and to experience God, but also to populate the earth with image bearers and to have a place from which um, we navigate the world. And so children, hospitality, turning outward, bearing the image of God together. If you have ever, whether in your own home with your parents or maybe in a church now, if you've ever had an older Christian couple who had a significant influence on your life, you probably can name very well that there's something they could do together that neither of them could do apart in your life. The way they cared for you, the way they related to each other, it brought a dynamic into play that was not there and could not be there when they were separated from each other. That, that Christian marriages should be missional. And again, the way I said it last night is, in the Christian story, sex is not just a gift to be enjoyed, it's a task to accomplish. Um, and one of the two or three, same-sex marriage is up there, but one of the other big tips of the iceberg that comes to the surface that reveals how different our culture story is on sex is the role of children. Our culture either thinks that children bear no direct organic connection to marriage and to sex, or at its worst, are something to be feared, something that are a threat to your happiness, and a curse. And the reality is that in scripture, it is a curse not to have children, to be infertile. Um, it is a blessing to have children, and I know that raises all kinds of pastoral, practical questions today. Um, but the reality is that just as God gave birth to us and gave birth to the world, part of bearing his image is that our sexuality allows us to bring new life into the world. And once that mission is over, we won't need that aspect of it anymore. But part of what your sexuality should be is whether you're single, whether you're married, it should be something that sets you towards the world, that sets you to service to others. One way to put it, and I'll move on the last couple of minutes to the last point, is um, there is a sense, and this goes back to something we did last night, there's a sense in which every no the Christian story tells to us on our sexual desires flows out of a prior beautiful good yes. No to this, because God said yes to this and that's good, but I think we need to say more than that. If you think about it like visually, there's a yes that gives rise to no's. But I'd also say this, and Wesley Hill is the one who taught me this, and I think it's brilliant, is every no God says to you also has a yes that comes after it, that arises out of the no he has said. And so maybe you get married and you can't have kids. 
and there's a no there. But there are going to be yeses that flow out of that. Maybe you don't want to be single and you are, and there's a no there. But there's a yes that flows out of that. And one of the things we need to do is to name the no's in our lives as themselves already bearing positive vocations for us. Um, often the no's, they just become no's. Sorry, you can't have fun here like the rest of us do. Sorry, you can't enjoy things the way the rest of us do. But every no, and this is true even when the no itself is just intrinsically bad, like suffering. Um, I'm teaching through 2 Corinthians with my grad students this semester. I've certainly seen this in my own life. A lot of the grace that has flowed out of me by God's grace to others, insofar as that's true, has actually arisen in the suffering of my life. And that's often how the gospel works. That it's the no's where new yeses arise. It's the deaths where new resurrection arises. And overall, marriage has this missional framework. And because it only has a subjective happiness framework in our culture, we often can't make sense of how scripture describes it and, and talks about it. So again, I would just... Um, say, if you want to get married, don't think about it as, as now we get to escape from the world and just gaze into each other's eyes forever. C.S. Lewis, and, and Jess will go to you here in a second, C.S. Lewis is a great image that, that lovers, married couples, are not just supposed to be face-to-face -face gazing into each other's eyes longingly, they're also to be shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder going towards the world together. They are partners to do something in the world, and, and that, I think, is, is one of the things our culture has lost. Jess? Um, in terms of the like, missional aspect of Sex. I, I completely agree yeah. that like, parenting is a really, really beautiful but, like beautiful aspect of being yeah. married. But as someone who's always been a really strong advocate of adopting, yeah. um, I don't, I mean, uh, to the point where I genuinely don't even really see the need for biological kids. Yeah. Um, be just because I just feel like, I mean, it part of kind of fits into the narrative of like yeah. being able to like be married and parent, but also being able to extend yeah. that love to someone who's not your family in a sense. Yep. Um. But so, but would would you consider like just wanting just a, like recommending that Christians just adopt instead of having biological kids, like having a you know like basically having a cake and you know eat it too kind of situation or what, how, how do you? Oh, it's such a great question. Um, I'm a huge fan of adoption. I, I think that Christians should really. I mean, adoption is central to the gospel story. Um, maybe the most practical way I could start there is I think if you have an intrinsic bias towards uh, adoption, maybe God wants me to do that, but I really want to have my own biological kids, that sentiment very easily becomes idolatry. Um, if you feel like there is a tragedy over your life because there are not going to be people who bear your bloodline after you die, I just think that we're not remembering the gospel story. Stanley Hauerwas has a lot of good stuff on this. And so yes, I don't think that anybody needs to feel like they have to adopt, but I'd love for Christians to really consider this. And part of that might actually be choosing not to have biological children so that you can adopt and adopt more. We'll talk about this this afternoon. I, I think we have to be really careful with this one for sure, but I also think that couples have the option, if they feel called by the Lord together, to not have biological children or adopt but not to be like, oh, now we have a Friday night's free and we can save up even more money for travel the world in these 70 years. That shouldn't be your story, but it could be we can decide. I'm going to front load or, or preview something we'll talk about this afternoon. One of the great needs in the church of this generation, just going to be super honest, after 15 years of pastoral ministry and as a guy, one of the great needs of this generation in the church is that young men just need to get discipled is that young men just need to get discipled. There are so many more young women who are following Jesus, numerically, but also the quality of their discipleship than the young men. And one of the greatest things older guys can do in the church is just be really intentional to get younger guys following Jesus and to disciple them. Some of that is guys are broken in ways women are. Some of that is our culture encourages men to be awful in ways that it does not encourage women to be awful. There's lots of reasons for it. But I would say that if you're married, one of the things you could do with your parenting calling is to just disciple a lot of young people in the church that you're a part of, to invite them into your home, to actually spend time with them. Paul was a father, even though he was single. He fathered Timothy and Titus and so many others. Um, but I do think parenting is an intrinsic part of husband and wife. I don't think there is any husband and wife without mother and father being a part of that as part of our calling. But I do think there's freedom for that to look different ways for different people. And again, we can talk practicals this afternoon. How many kids? When do you have kids? What do you do with New York City being expensive and small apartments? It's not easy. 
Um, but I do think one of the litmus tests should be, do we see children as a blessing or as a curse? Do we see them as central to who God has made us to be in the task of giving us? Or do we see them as just this optional extra after everything else has gotten sorted out in our lives? And that tends to be a revelation of what story we're actually living in. Um, so last thing, real quick, and if we need to, we can start with this after lunch. We'll get started right at one and finish at three. Um, that everything in sex is socially constructed. And what I mean by this is last night I mentioned that in Genesis 1, God names everything. But in Genesis 2, he gives us the task and the responsibility. And I would say even the invitation, the permission, the freedom to name things within the world. And, and so both as a sociological fact, it's true that everything you think, everything you perceive about the world, every moral sentiment you have is socially constructed. None of it came hardwired. None of it could be, none of it has to be that way. All of it could be other. It's because you've been nurtured, your habits have been formed, your vision has been shaped by the culture you grew up in. And that is actually part of what it means to be a human being. To be a human being, whether you like this or not, whether you agree with it or not, whether you see it or not, to be a human being is to be someone who has been given the task of naming the world. And every generation of human beings name the world. The question becomes, do we name it faithfully or do we name it unfaithfully? But we're naming the world. Nobody, this is one of the reasons, one of the many reasons that, not to pick on it too much, but when you run into a church that claims to be biblical, you should always kind of take that with a grain of salt because nobody's simply just regurgitating what scripture says. We're applying it to cultural situations. We're naming it in new ways. None of you are disobeying the scriptures because you didn't greet each other with a holy kiss this morning. But I do think that we need to find ways in our culture of greeting each other with a holy kiss that fit our culture. That is, in the ancient world, greet each other as siblings would. Relate to each other as siblings would. We need to name the world in such a way where we actually relate to each other like that as Christians. In our cultural context as Christians, we tend to relate each other as fellow consumers or fellow members of a voluntary association. We do not tend to relate to each other as family. That's one of the great tasks. What would it look like for us to greet each other and to welcome each other as family members? And it's going to look different in the 21st century than it did in the first century. Last thing I'll say, and then we'll pick up with this, and think about this over lunch if you want, is that one of the really hard issues, and a lot of you know this, when it comes to gender, what is the difference between a man and a woman? Between um, how one church in this cultural and historical moment lives out its faith, and that church in that historical and cultural moment lives out its faith, is What's creational and what's cultural? What's permanent and needs to always be there? And what's dynamic and up for grabs? And I think there is a sense in which that is already the wrong way to ask the question. And what I mean is this. You will never experience the created order that God has placed in the world apart from it already being dressed up in culture. You will never experience it nakedly. You will never have a pure gaze at it. It will always be dressed up in a culture already. And on the other hand, you will never experience culture as anything other than either a faithful act of naming the world or a rebellion against the order that God has placed there. Every aspect of culture is a rebellion against the created order or a faithful creative manifestation of it. That doesn't mean that there's only one right way to do culture. One of the great implications of it is there's a thousand right ways to do culture. There are also wrong ways to do culture. No culture is free, and this one could be controversial, no culture is free to say, hey, I'm your mom, and even after you get married, I'm still number one in your life. No culture is allowed to construct sex that way, even though a lot do. That is going against the created order. But what role does mom still play in my life after I'm married? There's a lot of freedom there. There's a lot of freedom there. It's not just one right or wrong answer there. No culture is allowed to say human beings of this race and color are less and we can do whatever we want with them and these aren't here. But how we dress and how we relate to each other and our economic systems and lots of other stuff, it really is up for grabs, which is why we should not balk or be embarrassed that 1 Corinthians 11 connects long hairstyles and short hairstyles to creation and nature. Um, and, and I'll end with this and we'll break for lunch. And you can think about it if you want. If you're this, one of the really hard things, one of the many really hard things about this cultural moment is that culture is shifting so quickly that you never quite know what the rules actually are. 
Um, which is actually, I think, one of the most distinctive things about our cultural moment. Culture has never in the history of the world shifted as quickly as it does now. A lot of the conflict in our society is because every five to ten year age gap means that you've been formed with incredibly different cultural practices and convictions. Um, and so we're often running into wars with each other. Um, but And so this one's not there anymore, and it, there's a sense in which it's all for grabs. But say you were a parent 30 years ago, and you had a son who was in high school. And he wants to go to his first prom. And he's got a crush on a girl. And he's 16 or 17, or say juniors in high school. And he asks her out to go to the prom. And she says yes. And, and, and let's say that you have a good relationship with your son. So he's actually open and he's talking to you and you're talking to him. And he's like, what do I do? I've never gone out on a date with a girl before. We're going to go to prom. And you say, well, you know, make sure that when she comes, you know, dressed up in her prom dress, that you tell her that she looks beautiful. And make sure that like at dinner that you pay the check. And make sure that you open the car door for her and make sure that you don't put your hands on her or do anything that would make her feel uncomfortable. He says, oh, okay, okay, okay. And he's kind of taking notes in his mind. It's like, why? And you say, because you're a boy, because you're a man. And that's how you should treat women in your life. Notice what's going on there. You're giving a culturally relative set of instructions grounded in creation. And I want you to notice two things there. I think those are the right instructions of that cultural moment. And it is true that because you are a man, you should relate to women this way. And it's also true that a thousand cultures can do it very differently than that, and they're not sinning against God. To simply say A, because creation is not to say that A is required of everybody in all times and places. That is one of the big mistakes conservative Christians make in the Bible is we read this, not this, because of creation, that doesn't mean that that specific form, long hair, short hair, is required of everybody everywhere, any more than a holy kiss is. It does mean that that, in that cultural moment, is an appropriate manifestation of naming the world in light of creation. And in every cultural moment, there are unfaithful wrong ways to name creation. And one of the tricks is how do we know where the boundaries are? And that's why we're talking about this. Um, but one of the things with dating with gender roles, with um, jobs, where all of a sudden, in some ways for the first time in history, women have access to careers as much as men do. What do we do with these things? And the two things we know ahead of time that we can't do is to simply in a reactionary way say, our culture's awful, let's go back, let's turn back the clock. Or, this is all amazing, we're the first human beings to ever be righteous, and we're the only ones to ever be righteous. Both of those, unilaterally approve, unilaterally condemn, is always a mistake. Within the created designs of God, we actually have freedom to name dating practices in this way and not that way. And it's not, as we end, the answers are not right and wrong. There are wrong answers, and there are right answers, but there's multiple right answers. There's, here's a faithful, creative way to name the world here. Here's a faithful, create, creative way to name the world over here. And I think Adam had freedom to be like zebra, kangaroo, and there wasn't like one right answer ahead of time. But if you looked at one of those animals and said sexual partner, he was naming the world wrongly. Because God had already named that. And so we name the world within God's naming of the world. But God does call us to participate with him in subduing and ruling over the world. And part of that is having the permission and invitation to name the world along with and under God. And I think some of this, and, and maybe just to name it this way, if you grew up in a conservative Christian environment, or, or that's where you are not, there's a lot that's good about that. You can probably tell. Ultimately, I am pretty conservative when it comes to sex in a lot of ways, theologically. But there is often an anxiety that conservative Christians have a deep worry, a sense of, oh, I'm, I'm really worried I'm going to make a mistake. And, and that's almost never what it's like. There are boundaries, but within the boundaries, there are a lot of ways to play the game well. There are a lot of ways to play the game well, and we should invite people into that. And every generation has the freedom, even the task, to figure out what does it look like for us to be faithful to God's purposes, to our own stories, to our own personalities, to our cultural moment. And there's a lot of freedom. And, and so there should be a sense of excitement for that. So in that sense, I mean, it's always socially constructed. Um, so we'll pick back up after lunch. And uh, Kirk, do you want to mention a couple of places? We'll start right at one. If you're, if you're late coming back, don't worry about it. Um, but yeah. All right, I have made out a list of some places. Thank you, Kirk. Up and down Bleecker and, and the neighborhood. Some of them, uh, you know, you'll recognize because they're chains or whatever. 